The government hates the idea of an anti-corruption body that operates like the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption. Those opposite want to support the sort of show in New South Wales, Mr Speaker, which has seen the most shameful, the most shameful attacks on the former Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, Mr Speaker. What was done to Gladys Berejiklian, the people of New South Wales know, was an absolute disgrace, Order. Mr Speaker. Order. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to have a kangaroo court taken the, into this parliament, the Mr Prime Speaker. Minister. This is, this is not the great, the great sort of uh, righteous process. It's, it's, it, it's a little bit Spanish Inquisitionist. Oh, look, it's certainly not a model that we'd ever consider at, at a federal level, and I think that's been on display for some time. The federal government finally agreed to establish an anti-corruption body called the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. It has been delayed by over three years, and the model is totally different to what states and territories have in place. And by different, I mean rubbish. When they consulted with the experts, the government received over 333 written submissions and not a single one was happy with the proposal. I went through this in detail in part two of this series. Link is in the description. In this video, I want to show you exactly what's wrong with the model the government has proposed. Of course, the government is pretending that their model will introduce an extremely powerful agency with powers exceeding a royal commission. The Commonwealth Integrity Commission, as you'll see in the legislation, will have greater powers than a Royal Commission. Uh, our, our particular bill suggests that the powers of the Commission are well in excess of, of a Royal Commission. But that's totally misleading. I'll come back to this, but having investigative powers is useless if they can't be applied, especially to politicians. It's like announcing a new fighter jet and saying it has the most powerful weapons in the world, except the jet can't fly. The weapons are useless no matter how powerful they are. Nevertheless, it's a good talking point for the government to repeat over and over again. However, the experts see things slightly differently. The National Integrity Committee, a group of senior retired judges, said that the government proposal falls disastrously short of providing an effective body to counter and expose corruption, and that this model will rightly be seen by the community as a sham and as a deliberate political diversion designed to shield the public sector, and in particular, politicians and their staff. The Accountability Roundtable, another prominent think tank, said that it will be a body with little or no ability to discover corrupt behaviour by parliamentarians or public sector corruption. And the Law Council, Australia's top legal body, said that they consider that the draft legislation has significant shortcomings. Here is Paul Fletcher, a senior Liberal Party minister, trying to pretend like that criticism doesn't exist. Our government has a well-developed, uh, carefully thought through model for the uh, Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Uh, and of course, we've gone through a very detailed process, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, hundreds of pages of uh, legislation are in the public domain. Uh, we've gone through a nationwide consultation process, uh, 333 written uh, submissions, uh, and of course we put in place the necessary funding. Okay, we need to clarify something. When the government says that they've done a detailed nationwide consultation and have received 333 submissions, what they actually mean is that they've spent a lot of time pretending to consult with experts, and then have ignored all of them. All the criticism I'm going to go through in this video was raised as part of that apparently detailed consultation but not a single aspect of the model was changed as a result of the feedback. Given the government isn't willing to budge on their model, it's worth comparing an effective anti-corruption body to what they've proposed. Spoiler alert, the Centre for Public Integrity, which is another group of former judges and law professors, did a comparison of all the state and territory anti-corruption bodies, as well as proposals from the Greens and independent Helen Haynes. It found that New South Wales and Queensland had the strongest and most effective anti-corruption bodies, and that the proposals by the Greens and Helen Haynes would be in line with that level of effectiveness. In case you're wondering where this video is going, here is how the government's proposal stacked up. The comparison revealed that the government's model will be the weakest and least effective integrity agency in the country. So what does an effective anti-corruption body look like and how does it function? I'm going to use the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC, as an example. Think of ICAC as a fact-finding body with a lot of investigative powers. 
he can get reports of corrupt conduct from anyone, and he's thus to piece the puzzle together. It has wide powers, so it can actually get into deep and hidden networks. It can hold private hearings, and then as the picture becomes clearer, it can hold public hearings if it thinks there is a public interest to do so. Once it has finalized its investigation, it then issues a report to the public of what it found. And in that report outlines a series of recommendations to help reduce the chance of corruption in the future. If it has found corrupt conduct and it thinks that those people should be prosecuted, then it can refer matters to the prosecutor to decide whether there is enough usable evidence for criminal charges to be laid and the process to be taken through the courts. The New South Wales ICAC investigates a broad range of people in government, including politicians and bureaucrats who are those that work in the public service. For example, Operation Cavill found that a local council mayor had engaged in multiple acts of corrupt conduct, or Operation Estuary, which found a number of prison officers had engaged in serious corrupt conduct. Many of these investigations don't get much media attention, if any at all. But every year, the New South Wales ICAC uncovers serious corruption in both politicians and public servants, which would otherwise go undetected. So let's compare that effective New South Wales model to what the federal government is proposing with their Commonwealth Integrity Commission, or CIC. Currently at a federal level, there is a body called ACLI, or the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity. ACLI investigates corruption in federal law enforcement bodies, like the Australian Federal Police and Border Force, but they don't look into politicians or bureaucrats. The government's proposal is to bring ACLI under the new CIC. So far, that sounds reasonable. But then the government wants to split the CIC to create two separate divisions. One is the Law Enforcement Integrity Division, which is basically a renamed version of ACLI to continue to investigate corruption within various federal law enforcement agencies. The other division is the Public Sector Integrity Division. This is new and will cover politicians and their staff, the rest of the public sector, like the Department of Defense and other departments, and some other entities that get government funding. It all seems overcomplicated, but the reason there are two separate divisions is because they will operate in totally different ways. The public sector side will have significantly less powers than the law enforcement side. But why is there even a split in the first place? Here is Christian Porter, then the Attorney General of Australia, trying to explain why. Uh, the rationale for that on the government's part is that there is a higher risk and a much greater um, threat from corruption inside law enforcement agencies insofar as they are the agencies that are meant to enforce the law. Okay, so basically the government is saying that the risk of corruption here is higher than here. That's interesting because the government provided no evidence or research that this is actually the case. In submissions to the consultations, the experts didn't agree with the government's view. The Human Rights Commission questioned the claim that the risk of corruption is higher in law enforcement agencies and noted no evidence of this. It said the risk of corruption is significant in the public sector where the majority of public spending occurs. The Australian Federal Police Association was more direct. In terms of where corruption is more likely, police officers enforce the law, but politicians create them. The National Integrity Committee summarised it well. The attempt to distinguish corruption in the two sectors is quite artificial. It is deliberately designed to make corruption in this area more difficult to detect and intended to protect politicians and other public officers. So then what exactly is the difference in treatment between these two sides? As it turns out, pretty much every significant thing is different. And as you dig deeper, you start to get a sense of why the Liberal National Party is so adamant that politicians be treated differently. For starters, the definition of corruption is different for both sides. For law enforcement agencies, corrupt conduct is defined as engaging in any of the following conduct, abusing the staff member's office, perverting the course of justice, or corruption of any other kind. That's a really broad definition. However, for politicians, corrupt conduct is defined differently. The reference to corruption of any kind isn't applicable to them. Instead, there has to be conduct which is an abuse of their position or perverting the course of justice that also constitutes a listed offence. So for the law enforcement side, corruption of any kind is captured. But for politicians, it needs to be specific to a predetermined list of criminal offences. Don't worry though, because the government wants you to know that the list of offences is very long and comprehensive. 
It's a very, very long list. So I would say to people, have a look at all of the matters that are on that list. I mean, in my observation, they cover virtually every conceivable type of serious criminal conduct that one might label corruption. Uh, again, people might take different views about that and those views will be ventilated. But again, that's not the reality. The Law Council said that the list of offences is narrow and excludes state and territory offences and common law offences like misconduct in public office. Submissions also pointed out that corrupt conduct often extends beyond set criminal offences. For example, conduct that won't be captured by the CIC includes favouritism in granting contracts and appointments, the misuse of confidential information, the misuse of public funds for political gain, serious conflicts of interest and serious misuse of entitlements, and serious breaches of codes of conduct. But there is another hurdle that only applies to the public sector division. The CIC cannot even start an investigation unless it already has a reasonable suspicion that one of these set offences has been committed. One submission made a really good point on this. A lot of the time you'll need to investigate a tip-off first to figure out if there is a reasonable suspicion. This high threshold will stop many investigations from even happening at all. The whole difference in the definition of corruption between law enforcement agencies and the public side, which includes politicians, is a farce. The government has been deceptive about the whole thing. Either that, or they have no idea what they're talking about. They don't want an integrity commission, Mr Speaker. They just want to engage in the slurs. Mr Speaker, criminal co corrupt conduct is the sort of conduct, Mr Speaker, that sent the, uh, the former minister, Ian Macdonald, Mr Speaker, to prison, which the leader of the opposition was a keen supporter of, Mr Speaker. Let's put aside the guilt by association smear from Scott Morrison and ignore the fact that Ian Macdonald was expelled from the Labour Party almost a decade ago. What the Prime Minister is saying is that his proposal would go after serious criminals like Ian Macdonald, who was a New South Wales Labour Minister in the late 90s and early 2000s. According to Morrison, his proposal is very different from the New South Wales ICAC, which is just about political smears. But just about everything he said is nonsense. First, Ian Macdonald and another Labour Minister, Eddie Abid, were investigated by the New South Wales ICAC. That investigation was successful in identifying the corruption and they were both jailed in subsequent criminal trials. So the model he's bagging out actually worked properly. The second thing, and this is more important, is that Ian Macdonald was jailed for misconduct in public office. That is a common law offence which from my understanding, Scott Morrison's proposal wouldn't be able to capture because it is not part of the set list of offences. The Law Society of New South Wales makes this clear. The government's model would not be able to even begin a similar investigation that brought down Ian Macdonald in New South Wales. That is how weak and ineffective it would be. And it gets much worse. I mentioned earlier that the government keeps pretending that their model has greater powers than a royal commission. Greater powers than a royal commission. Well, one of the most important powers of a royal commission is the ability to hold public hearings. The CIC is also able to hold public hearings, but only for the Law Enforcement Integrity Division. It's a different story for the public side. Section 99 of the legislation says that a hearing on a public sector corruption issue, so those covering politicians, must be held in private. This is apparently to stop reputations and careers being damaged. Well, if we look at the, the history of the New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, um, its broad sweeping powers of inquisition and compulsion have seen lives destroyed over trivialities, uh, careers ended over investigations that have gone nowhere, and the tarnishing of the reputations of people who appear as witnesses, not as suspects, only to find themselves painted guilty in the public eye by their mere appearance. Except the government cares mainly about their own reputations and careers, because everyone working on the law enforcement side is still subject to public hearings. What about their reputations? The National Integrity Committee summarises the government's position well. A corrupt police officer may be the subject of a public hearing, but not a corrupt politician. How can this possibly be fair or be justified? This carve-out to protect the reputation of politicians is even more ridiculous when you consider that hearings into the misconduct of judges are held in public. Judges also have reputations to protect. But let's put all that aside. 
There are really good reasons why an anti-corruption body needs to have the power to hold public hearings. Public hearings expose corruption and misconduct to the public. They increase public trust. They encourage more witnesses to come forward. They educate on corruption and misconduct issues, and they act as a powerful deterrent. Witnesses are also under greater pressure to be honest in their answers. That's not to say all hearings conducted by an anti-corruption body need to be in public. New South Wales ICAC already has the discretion not to hold public hearings if it doesn't see the need. And a lot of the time it doesn't. In this investigation, which found corrupt conduct by a service New South Wales employee, the commission decided it didn't need to hold a public hearing. One final point on public hearings. One submission had a quote from Tony Fitzgerald, and I think it's worth sharing. Tony Fitzgerald was a judge who led an extremely successful inquiry into police corruption in Queensland in the 1980s. That inquiry led to the jailing of four politicians and the police commissioner, the disbanding of an entire police unit, and the downfall of the Premier. Tony Fitzgerald himself said that the proposal to close anti-corruption hearings and repress information on public issues to save those involved from embarrassment demonstrates a fundamental ignorance of democracy. Effective democracy depends on informed voters. We already have so many transparency issues in Australia. The last thing we should be doing is adding more. You might be thinking, well, there are no public hearings, but at least there will be a report released to the public once the investigation is complete, with all the facts and findings, just like a Royal Commission or State ICAC. But no, that won't necessarily happen. The proposed CIC will release a report, but what goes into the report differs depending on who is being investigated. If the report is about staff of a law enforcement agency, then the report must have the findings of corruption, the evidence that the findings are based on, actions needing to be taken and any recommendations. But when a report is released about the public side, for example about a politician, the report can no longer include the findings or the evidence those findings are based on. What kind of double standard is that? Don't worry though, the government has an excuse for this as well. The public sector side of the Integrity Commission is not designed to make public reports. It is designed to create briefs of evidence on any of those 143 offences in the public sector, which would constitute corrupt conduct, which would go to the DPP for public trial and conviction or acquittal, depending on how that trial transpired. But the experts dismiss this in their submissions. The ACT government noted that under their model, which is common across various states, the anti-corruption body can both refer matters for prosecution, but also make public findings following an investigation. There's no reason both can't happen. Because there are differences in the standards of proof and evidence required in a criminal court, prosecution might not happen or be successful. And that's fair enough. The reason there is such a high bar in a criminal court is because the consequences are that people can be jailed. ICAC doesn't jail anyone. It exposes the facts for the public to see. The burden of proof is going to be different. Operation Spicer is a perfect example. Remember this guy from part one of this series and his corruption-themed birthday cake? The New South Wales ICAC investigation found plenty of misconduct, but in some instances the prosecutor didn't have sufficient evidence to press criminal charges against some of the main players. But ICAC still included these findings in their report so the public was aware of the conduct. In other investigations, it can take ages for the prosecutor to even consider the brief that's been provided to them. It could take years to prosecute, during which time the corrupt politician will still stay in a position of power. For example, in December 2019, the New South Wales ICAC provided their brief of evidence to the Department of Public Prosecutions into serious corrupt conduct relating to a cover-up by prison officers. It's been over two years and there is still no update as to what the prosecutor's decision will be. But under the federal government's proposal, if corrupt conduct by a politician is found by the CIC, a brief is forwarded to the prosecutor. If they think there is corrupt conduct, but not enough evidence to get a conviction in court, then no one will ever know about the whole thing. The hearings would have been in secret, and the report wouldn't be allowed to include any details of the corruption. It's also really important that an anti-corruption body is able to get referrals or tip-offs from a wide range of sources. The New South Wales Ombudsman said in their submission that corruption by its very nature is hidden and that research has consistently shown that the best source of information concerning serious wrongdoing within an organisation is from insiders, often employees. 
This is why the first thing you see when you go on many of the state ICAC websites is this. Report corruption. Report now. Report. You get the idea. The good news is that the law enforcement side of the CIC is able to get referrals of corruption from anyone, including members of the public, even anonymously. But, and at this stage I'm sure you won't be surprised, this doesn't apply to the public sector division. For politicians and the public service, referrals can only come from a few very specific people, like the Attorney General, responsible ministers and heads of departments. You know, all the people that would be last in line to raise concerns. The Law Council points out scenarios that won't allow tip-offs to be made. For example, a politician won't be able to report the corruption of another politician. And someone working within the government, or a member of the public with relevant information, won't be able to make a tip-off. The Law Council says that this limitation to who can refer is without justification. But they're being nice about it. I think it's absolutely laughable. And as if that's not a big enough joke already, there are more differences in referral powers. For the Law Enforcement Division, the CIC is able to start its own investigations without a referral if it becomes aware of an allegation or information. This is called own motion powers. But that same power isn't available when investigating politicians. So why the double standard yet again? Christian Porter, thankfully, is there to run us through the logic. Well, um, it's not a, not a double standard at all because the Public Sector Integrity Commission would require referrals through one of the other multi-agencies, the other, other 11 agencies. Law enforcement uh, would still have the ability to have direct public, um, direct public referrals. And indeed, there's an ability to refer between law enforcement and the public sector division. But in answer to your question, one of the reasons why, when you cover hundreds of thousands of people, Politics. right? but well, politicians, people at universities, people at the SBS and the ABC, in the very heightened environment that we exist in at the Commonwealth level, there is a tendency for some to refer for motives that aren't entirely pure. What's ridiculous is that the government leaves out one important fact with their proposal. One person is allowed to refer allegations to the CIC with almost none of the limitations everyone else has. Him. That's right, the Attorney General can refer to the Integrity Commissioner an allegation or information that raises a corruption issue. The experts are baffled by this. The Attorney General should not enjoy the privileged power to initiate a referral. It carries grave risk of misuse for party political advantage or retribution. Exactly the thing the government was apparently trying to avoid. That doesn't stop the government's scripted lines. One of the things that we do need to be really careful of is that you don't set up a structure that then allows for political purpose and political gain one party to actually prosecute um, somebody from another party just for that political gain. Sure. So the government's position is that the CIC can't accept referrals from people who work for the government or members of the public, which is where most referrals are likely to come from, because they don't want referrals with bad motives. Literally every investigative body around the world has this issue. The police don't turn around and say, sorry, the public can't report crimes because someone might make a false complaint. There needs to be a process in place for this. That's how the state anti-corruption bodies handle it. Jeffrey Watson, a barrister who has assisted the New South Wales ICAC in a number of hearings, including the ones that took down Ian MacDonald and Eddie Abid, is pretty direct with how bad the referral system is in the government's proposal. What do you make of this proposal? Does this indicate a government which is serious about rooting out corruption? No, just the opposite. This is a hopeless model. Oh wait, not that bit. If the Auditor General, who's done so much good work of late, recognised a problem, the Auditor General couldn't make a referral. The Auditor General could only report to a minister and then keep his fingers crossed that the minister acts upon it. So. It, it, even at the first hurdle, it collapses. Joe, can I just remind some of your viewers, there was a famous inquiry conducted by the late David Ipp into the Obeid family. That commenced following an anonymous tip-off. Now, that matter would be excluded from the Commonwealth proposal. Couldn't look at it. The fact that the Audit Office, which identified the Leppington Triangle scandal, wouldn't be able to refer directly to the CIC is telling enough. But more worrying is the fact that the CIC would not have been able to accept the tip-off that led to the Eddie Obeid and Ian MacDonald investigation. Not only that, but the government has made sure that anyone thinking about blowing the whistle on corruption 
is deterred even more. Let me introduce section 70. The government wants to create a new offence where referring corruption without reasonable suspicion to cause detriment could lead to a 12-month prison sentence. This is vague wording and could apply widely and is a massive deterrent to reporting corruption. It also doesn't apply to referrals in the law enforcement division. Why? If you're worried about false allegations being made, why not apply this solution to everyone? The criticism of this in the submissions was heavy, with some calling for this offence to be removed completely from the legislation. The Law Council also said that 12 months imprisonment was too strong of a sentence, and for perspective, the proposed legislation creates other offences for corrupt conduct, some of which have prison sentences less than 12 months. There are other issues that have been raised, which I'm not going to go through in detail here because the situation just isn't clear. There's confusion about retrospectivity and how well the CIC is able to look at past conduct if it is finally established. Then there's questions around its funding and concerns that it's not enough to actually be able to do its role properly. But overall, it is a garbage proposal that is designed to protect politicians. And it's been sold as having more powers than a royal commission. It's no wonder then that this is what integrity experts are saying. It would be better not to have a commission at all rather than have this particular model. Luckily, there is still hope. There are real alternatives to this model. And my next video will go through those. If you made it to the end, then thank you. These videos take ages to make. And right now I'm a one man show. If you'd like to help support this channel grow, consider checking out my Patreon page. Links are in the description below.